Welcome to our discussion today uh, about pipe water to the Colorado River high-speed rail and upgrading the electrical uh, grid for the 21st century. Uh, we're very lucky to have uh, four presenters today to discuss with us a number of the things that uh, uh, are important as far as infrastructure, but more importantly, how we finance it, which is what the Infrastructure Bank is all about. My name is Bob Lynn. I'm a retired union organizer with the Plumbers and Pipe Fitters in Toledo, Ohio. Uh, I was also their political director. Uh, I've done uh, a number of things and have been a member of the coalition for a number of years. And I'm very happy to, to be here and to host this uh, segment. We're gonna start off first with Dr. Alexander Metcalf, uh, who is uh, president of the Transportation Economics and Management Company, international expert in rail, ports and supply chains, and he's out of Frederick, Maryland. Uh, so Dr. Metcalf, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. We'll go to the, the, the first slide on this. Um, what we're gonna be talking about today is basically development of a national uh, intercity high-speed rail uh, network that would link up the majority of the population in America. Now, the most amazing thing about high-speed rail is that the market and the conditions of high-speed rail have been changing rapidly over the last 40 years. When we look at what you know, a lot of people think about what the potential for high-speed rail is, such as this network that was produced by the FRA, what we find out is that really what they're still thinking about is a bunch of corridors that are disconnected and don't really provide a national system for high-speed rail. Next slide. This is the network for a national high-speed rail system that the High-Speed Rail Association uh, has developed and we help them with that. And you can see that they're talking about a network that would allow you to crisscross the country and to connect up all of the major cities in, in the world, uh, in America. Uh, the reason that this network has not been considered by the FRA and others is that they really don't understand what have been the fundamental changes that have created this opportunity, which would be to build a high-speed rail network, which is comparable to the interstate system. Next slide. By the way, the cost of that network would be about a trillion dollars, which is very much in line with basically the uh, budget that the, uh, um, the bank is kind of thinking about as part of its application to government. When we began looking at uh, high-speed rail back in the 1980s, and I call it phase one, basically I was asked by the uh, European uh, Union International de de Fer, to which is the union of the of the railroads in uh, in Europe, to look at what the potential for high speed rail was in America, and I put on the map those uh, lines, those red lines that you can see, and you can see that those red lines are basically within the mega regions of America. And for instance, we got the Northeast Corridor. We got Florida, we got Texas, and we got California. This is some of the mega regions. There are other emerging mega regions, such as the Front Range in the middle of the country. But by and large, when you looked at the map in 1980, those four areas were the greatest potential for high speed rail. Next slide. The reason for the, that was that at that time, the technology for high-speed rail was embryonic. We had trains that were capable of 125 miles an hour, trains capable of 150 miles an hour, but that was the top speeds that anybody was thinking about for high-speed rail. So this base system would allow some corridors to be developed in America, but not a national system. Next slide. But it would allow about 2,000 miles of high-speed rail network to have been put up in the country. Uh, and basically, that would actually have included 76 million people out of a population at that time, about 
230 million, or actually 35% of the population of the country. So it would have connected a lot of people. And that's because a lot of people live in those mega regions that are dense and have very high uh, populations like New York, for example, or, or Southern California. Next slide. Okay, in phase two, that really began in the 1990s, uh, we began to see a potential expansion, which are the blue lines on this map for high-speed rail because of a series of factors that occurred in the markets that basically were the intercity transportation system in America. Next slide. The first thing was there was an absolute revolution in high-speed rail technology and basically train speeds were pushed up from 150 miles an hour to 185 miles an hour, making travel between cities that were further apart more attractive. The vehicle designs were improved significantly the, uh, uh, and the capital and maintenance costs were significantly reduced. Modularization was the word of the day in the high-speed rail business, and now you didn't fix anything on the train. You just took a module out and stuck another one in, and you were ready to rock and roll. Next slide. The other thing that happened between 1980 and 2000 is we got the idea in America that we'd like to deregulate the air system. And as you remember, uh, you know, most cities had 120 major airports around America had a uh, really nice air service back in 1980. However, this deregulation meant that over 50 cities in America lost their uh, jet service or got some kind of inferior jet service that was done by a jump jet kind of technology. And for all of us big guys who get on planes and hate those small seats and crowded conditions, suddenly the quality of air service fell dramatically. And we were basically finding ourselves uh, not as happy traveling by air as we used to be. For instance, Toledo, our, 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 our friend from Toledo there, uh, basically lost a lot of passenger service. So uh, the major airports were really beginning to not be as attractive as they were. Next slide. The other thing that was happening was, and this is a, a USDOT map, it shows where congestion on highways was increasing. And it was increasing at a heck of a rate. So suddenly they, they were saying, well, those highways that we built in the 1960s, particularly in the mega regions, are now going to be so congested and travel times are going to increase that we've got a crisis on our hands. So the interstate system that was really built for freight transportation and for intercity uh, passenger travel suddenly was bogged down because commuter volumes were so significant that basically every time you arrived at a town, it took you a long time to go around it. Even if you went on the ring road, there was massive congestion during six hours a day, which is probably when you wanted to go through those cities. Next slide. But despite all that, so as a result of all that, really, in the 1990s, the uh, amount of rail that you could build in America and operate effectively rose to about 8,000 miles. And that would cover about 150 million people uh, out of 250 we had at the time, and it was about 60% of the population. Okay, next slide. So what happened was that as the next 10 years went by, we came to the year 2000, the map suddenly, op the opportunity for high-speed rail suddenly increased again. And what we found was that basically all those green lines would now have potential. I myself was doing studies all over the country, looking at these corridors. And what was very significant from a point of view of a national network is a front range area around Denver suddenly became uh, having potential for a high-speed rail system. We did studies there and showed them that we could build from the airport up to Vail or from uh, Wyoming through to Pueblo without any problem and operate a high-speed rail system that would be effective 
uh, in, in that corridor. So also we see on the West Coast, the gradual emergence of both the Pacific Northwest and the uh, Southern and Northern California corridors that had now potential, that previously had no potential. And in the east of the Mississippi, we had a whole network beginning to shape up that could effectively provide the basis for a national system. And what was causing that to happen? Well, let's look at the next slide. Firstly, gas prices. Gas, it's hard to remember that a barrel of oil in 1999, okay, just 20 years ago, was $19 a barrel. Guess what those rubber barons are getting today? They're getting 120. Sometimes it's down to 70. And if it gets to 50, the whole oil industry starts to complain about how expensive uh, you know, and how difficult it is to make oil, to get oil out of the ground. And, you know, these $50 a barrel are really, you know, totally inadequate for us to run our industry. So high gas prices have been very important in persuading, in, in encouraging people to want to find an alternative mode to driving their car. Okay, so the idea of $4, and I think we just had that, a short time ago, uh, uh, this this last last uh, couple of months, uh, basically four to six dollars a bar a gallon was really something that the uh, population found was really uh, upsetting, and it encouraged them to look for other ways to travel. Next slide. One of the ways they found was to, uh, and which was due to this gas price increases that we're seeing was basically increased Amtrak ridership. Rail became suddenly much more popular. And it's amazing to see that between the year 2000 and the 2020, that Amtrak as a national system got a 50% increase in its market share, 50%. It went from 22 million up to 32 million. Okay, so it got a huge increase in its traffic every year, piling on 3% more, 3% more, because people were finding this congestion and gas prices, the lack of air service, all problematic in terms of the way they wanted to travel in the intercity marketplace. As a result of that, we basically had, sorry, can we go to the next slide? an increase from 8,000 to over 10,000 miles of, of high-speed rail that would have potential in terms of uh, being a, uh, an effective system. So that would be uh, 214 million people included out of a population of 280, because the population keeps, keeps growing, and basically a percent of the population that could be within an hour's drive of an intercity system. When I go from Frederick, Maryland to New York, I drive an hour to Baltimore and I get the train up to New York. Easiest way to go. Who wants to go to New York and pay $40 to park your car in the middle of New York? Okay, so what we're saying is the market conditions were making it more and more attractive to use rail. Okay, next slide. Well, now we get up to date and here we are in 2020, and not only are we seeing that high-speed rail is effective at connecting the basic uh, 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 mega regions within each within each mega region, but these mega regions are beginning to merge, and we are beginning to build a national network. And what we see is that the this new network incorporates two very critical pieces in building a national network. Kansas City to Denver, a 600 mile distance. Okay, why, how could high-speed rail be effective on a 600 mile distance? Okay, Dallas to uh, Albuquerque, and then basically Cheyenne across to Reno and Albuquerque across to Phoenix and, uh, and LA. If you can put that middle piece in place, given the mega regions that we have on either coast and or across the midwest and down into the south with population increasingly moving south what we see is we firstly we've now looking 
at what could be described as a national network, not just a series of, you know, Miami to Orlando or, or New York to Boston or San Francisco to, to Los Angeles. Now we have a national network. We've got a network that means you can go coast to coast and you can go from Green Bay to New Orleans. Okay, so that we now have a national network. And what caused that? Next slide. Well, high-speed rail is now going 300 miles an hour. So a 600-mile distance from Kansas City to Denver can be done in two hours. Okay, two hours. I mean, you, you, you spend an hour hanging around at the airport first to get your ticket and get on the plane. You spend an hour uh, getting your luggage at the other end. A two-hour trip by rail will be highly competitive, even with air at 600 miles. That's the critical thing. Once high-speed rail is competitive at 600 miles, building a national network is absolutely a breeze, okay? If you can't, if you can go 300 miles an hour or even 240, two and a half hours to, from Kansas City to, to Denver sounds like a very reasonable trip for someone to make by high-speed rail, especially if it's downtown to downtown. Next slide. One of the things really happened in since 20 uh, year 2000, and that is that the market for express parcels is just expanding dramatically. OK, we're talking e-commerce expanding at 15 percent a year. These boys like Prime and FedEx and UPS and the post office, they've got to expand there and create double their infrastructure every eight to 10 years. So we've worked with UPS and we know the pressure they're under. They hate airplanes and you know they're okay with trucks. A lot of them UPS guys grew up with trucks, so they like trucks. But the fact of the matter is there isn't enough capacity in the system to basically handle express parcels. You want your parcel tomorrow or two days or three days, We've got to put infrastructure in place to make that happen. They are big investors in transportation systems. Look at you know what's happened at uh, uh, Missouri. I mean, basically, uh, you know, we are basically looking at uh, one of the biggest aircraft operators being these people. So they would love the opportunity to run express parcel traffic at night on a high-speed rail system. That would increase the revenues associated with the uh, high-speed rail system by 40% and basically make them extremely more profitable than they would have been if you just run them for passengers for 16 hours during the day, okay? So next slide. Okay, what has this all done? This has mean that in 1980, when I first started looking at this, we couldn't really say that there were any markets that were really very exciting in America, that many of the markets were only short distances, you know, Miami to Orlando or San Francisco to, uh, to, to LA. And really they couldn't pay the capital costs. So it would have to be a fully paid for by the feds, a trillion dollars, okay? What we're saying now, however, is with that increase in speed from 110 miles an hour to 240 or 300 miles an hour, 70 or 80 percent of the capital costs of building the system of a trillion dollars can be paid for directly out of the fare box, all the revenues from, from express parcels, so that we were, would be able to make a massive contribution to that infrastructure. So unlike the interstate system, that was 100% federal, okay, with 20% match from the states. What we're looking at now is a system that says with 20% match from the states, we could basically pay for the uh, system out of the, the fare box. So that is a complete radical change over 40 years of what is possible with high-speed rail. High-speed rail is a reality in America today. We could start building it today and we would be able to start getting that capital back out of the users of the system, which is the way we like to do it in America. 
we would like American Airlines to pay all its costs. Of course, it doesn't. A lot of the airports get built for it and it just pays user fees. But this system has the ability now for the first time to basically provide cover for the capital costs, a return on investment, as the lads on Wall Street like to call it, and basically has the ability to produce massive economic benefits for the communities it goes for. Remember, a high-speed train can stop in a small town along the way. You know, you don't get too many air, air, you know, the airline industry is saying, hey, we don't want to stop unless it's at least 400 miles trip, you know, whereas high-speed trains can stop every 50 miles and we can change the service so it will do that. So there is now no reason why we aren't investing, except nobody recognizes that there is this potential for building a national network for high-speed rail. Next slide. Okay, when we, when we look at that network, that red network I showed you, what we've got is 15,000 miles of high-speed rail. Well, it's not quite as much as China has built in the last 20 years, but it's getting there. We're providing coverage that 290 million people would actually be within an hour of basically this high-speed network out of our, uh, and that would give us at least 86% of the population being able to use high-speed rail uh, in, their, in their life. And that we would also help reduce traffic on the interstate by moving express freight off it. If you go on the Ohio Turnpike, what you find is great big truck trains with you know a, tr a truck and then two uh, following, uh, follow following uh, units. And what we're saying is that will all divert over to, to the high-speed rail because basically, the truck industry, uh, uh, you know, would find it more cost effective to use uh, to use high speed rail, uh, and basically, so would the air industry. The most profitable business that British Rail ran while I was in Britain was basically its express parcel business. It was the most profitable, and Red Star Parcel, as they called it, made a lot of money. If we were to combine those two things. We could pay out of the fare box and out by the users for a trillion dollar investment in infrastructure. It would probably take us like the interstate system 20 years to build. But what we're saying today as planners is, hey, this is an investment that we can make that can radically reduce, change the mobility of America, provide all sorts of economic benefits and jobs and and great incomes for the workers. If we put it to ourselves that now is the time to start on a high-speed rail network, rather than rather than just you know let California build a few miles, you know let the Northeast Corridor be sort of improved a little bit. We should be basically making a very heavy investment in that network and basically building ourselves a national network. Next slide. Okay, so what can I say? We can get to 80% of the American people uh, would find this system effective. We're saying that if we introduce pass, express parcels and freight, that will generate significant revenues uh, that basically at the moment are they're having problems, the, the, the uh, express parcel industry is having problems with the airlines and with the truckers. Nobody wants to drive a truck these days. And basically, uh, we would have a very effective approach. We could even then probably, just like the air industry, get the private sector involved and basically get them to help support the investment. But we're saying that 80% of the investment could be covered out of the, the revenues that could be generated. It's very similar to the Japanese model, which is the only passenger rail system in the world which actually covers its not only its operating costs, but its capital costs as well. And this could be done. And I just make the final point that the express freight business is very willing to invest. I work with UPS in Rockford Airport, which was a disused airport, and which is today the uh, 14th biggest freight airport in America. And they are, 
you know, very enthusiastic about something like high speed rail because it gives them that very fast movement of parcels and express between cities in, in America. If we build this system, this system will be very, very economic and financially have a strong rate of return. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Dr. El uh, Dr. Alexander Metcalf, for that explanation. Um, uh, it, <clears throat> with what we're talking about, what you're talking about there, to be able to do it, it, it reminds me, uh, uh, if anyone's been on these calls before, uh, when the, we talk about the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, it was a lending program, not a spending program. And if we continue to look at this National Infrastructure Bank as that, a lending program, where it's actually then repaid by the users and that, the rest of that stuff that continue to make this bank even more effective and more uh, important at this moment. So thank you very much for that. I understand you have to depart and uh, you have other things that you have to do, but thank you very much. If there are other questions for you, uh, we're going to take those questions, forward them to you if you can get the answers back and then we'll make sure they get to the right parties. We'd like to do that. Thank you very much indeed for your attention and your consideration. All right, thank you very much for that. Uh, now we're going to uh, move forward here a little bit. I would ask that anybody who's on the call who's never been on before, uh, if you could just go up to your more button and raise your hand so we kind of get a head count of how many people have never been on this call before. So when I switch over to Alfeca here, she has an idea if we have some uh, new uh, people who haven't been on, I see at least one. We got anybody else who's new, never been on a call before? Looks like there's three. All right, four. All right, well, there's at least a, several people who are new to this. And so, uh, Alfeca, I'm gonna turn the floor over to you. Uh, and if you could just give us a brief uh, outline of what the banks, uh, what what's important about this bank, how it works a little bit, give us that brief, uh, description, I think that'd be really handy. And then we'd be able to uh, start to continue to move this conversation forward. So Alfeca, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much. My name is Alfeca Mutardi. I'm with the Coalition for National Infrastructure Bank. I'm a macro economist, worked for 25 years at the International Monetary Fund. And I've been helping the, um, the office of Congressman Danny Davis who is the main co-sponsor of our bill to get us ready for the reintroduction of our bill into the next session of Congress. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that, a little bit about the features of the bill. And for those new people that are on the call, I'll go really quickly how through how the National Infrastructure Bank works. So uh, I do have a few slides that'll explain. Uh, oop, there we go. Uh, the uh, bill that we have in Congress, uh, which uh, ended with the uh, the end of the 117th Congress uh, at the end of December, uh, uh, needs to be reintroduced. Uh, but I want to explain what the features of the bill are because the new bill is pretty much like the old bill with the proviso that we've updated it for things like all of these wonderful updates that Dr. Metcalf just gave us on high-speed rail, which are now <laughs> included in the language of the new bill, thank goodness. So um, what this bill does, it's HR 3339 in the past Congress, it'll get a new bill number in the new one, but what it does is it creates a very large public bank to lend for infrastructure projects all across the country. As the uh, as Bob just mentioned, this is a lending, not spending through the budget type of an instrument. And it was used four times before successfully in our nation's past. The reason those banks aren't around anymore is they had a 20 year sunset clause in them, which is why we knew it need a new fifth bank. The other reason we need a bank like this is we're just not able to finance infrastructure, either through the federal budget or through state and local budgets. Uh, and uh, that's why uh, essentially we need a, a budget to top up all of the spending to uh, complement our infrastructure needs across the country. This is sort of the way the really, really quickly how the bank works. It uses the same principle that was developed by Alexander Hamilton for the first bank of the United States. When you open a bank like this, any bank, you need two things. You need to capitalize the bank, which is kind of like a 
a, a, a pile of money that sits on the bank, acts like a rainy day fund, uh, and you need to maintain this capitalization on your bank's books. And then you give out loans exactly like a commercial bank. So to do the capitalization part, what we'll be doing is going to the private sector who are holding treasuries for savings or investment purposes and get them to sell in a small portion of them into the NIB to act as capital and exchange it for preferred stock. They'll get a little bit extra dividend for their investment. And the uh, the dividend will come out of money from the earnings from the NIB's loans. And this bank is self-sustaining, so it doesn't require infusions from any budget to subsidize its operations over time. It stands on its own. And then the bank goes on to give out loans exactly like a commercial bank does. Uh, it provides, um, it uses the same accounting software and everything. And you might be surprised to know that when banks give out loans, they actually create money. That's how 90% of our money supply in the United States was created by commercial banks that take in deposits. And when they give out a loan, they actually add to the money supply. This the bank would be no different. And then it would use deposits coming in from elsewhere to move money around the banking system. Loan terms would be really low. This is a public Bank, we want to find. We want to uh, make sure that we're um, providing low cost possible loans, and then borrowers would be state and local governments or anybody that owns a bit of infrastructure could come in for a bank for a loan. Now we had under HR three 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 nine planned to lend out five trillion dollars over ten years, and that's the way the last bill was configured. However, there has been a new development that is going to affect how much uh, money can go for high-speed rail at, along the lines of Dr. Metcalf's plan, how much can go for water projects, as some of our other speakers are going to talk to you about in a minute, how much can go for electric grid projects. And one thing that has happened in the interim between these two bills is we've had inflation. We've had a lot of inflation a big spike in inflation. This is what our inflation over the last 30 years or so has looked like. We had a big spike in inflation in the 1970s and 80s. It was mostly low inflation since then, except that with the COVID uh, outbreak, with supply chain problems, with the outbreak of the war in Ukraine, and with the government make, make it, giving a lot of stimulus checks, and the Fed printing a lot of money, all those factors went into a big jump up in inflation. I'm sorry about my little uh, you know, line here on the picture to fix it because uh, the, the last month is not yet on the Federal Reserve's chart and it'll, be, it'll come out in a few days. But we've gone from around one or 2%, one or two, here's the numbers themselves year by year, one or 2% inflation uh, up until this point. And then all of a sudden in 2021, we had uh, nearly 5% inflation. And then in 2022, we had an average of 8% inflation for the year. This affects how much money is available for infrastructure, just like you pay more money when you go to the grocery store for food or to the gas pump to get gas. The same thing happens to spending for infrastructure projects. And the whole point of our bank is to make sure we have enough money available to cover all of our infrastructure needs over a 10 year period. So our last bill had planned to spend $5 trillion, that's $5,000 billion, over a 10 year period to cover a whole host of infrastructure projects. So our last bill uh, provided $5 trillion, but it was in real or constant dollars. Now we have to provide and uh, take account of this, uh, this big bump in inflation to provide more money through our bank to account for the effects of inflation. So this is the calculation that accounts for these. Instead of uh, if you convert from constant 2019 dollars, which is the basis for our uh, last bill. Uh, uh, if you account for that, for the effect by the year 2024 of inflation, the past inflation we've had, it means you need much more money. Now you need $625 billion that year to provide in loans. Going out into year 10, we now need $776 billion to provide in loans from the bank. If you sum it all up, it means that under our new bill, 
we're really going to need $7 trillion instead of $5 trillion to finance all the infrastructure bank projects that we need. And what do those projects look like? So here is our past bill, $5 trillion expressed in billions of dollars. And the basis for it was the American Society of Civil Engineers who said that's how much money in real dollar, in constant dollars we need over 10 years to finance all these things. Wrote new money, this is additional new money we need above and beyond what the federal budget provides, what state and local budgets provide, what the bond market provides. This is additional money we need to make sure we can fix everything. And uh, we have large numbers for all these things uh, expressed in real dollars, but if we have to now inflate them by 40%, to $7 trillion, we're going to need a whole lot more in every category, roads and bridges, uh, water and drinking water systems, power infrastructure, uh, uh, fixing airports, bridges, roads, ports. Uh, and then we want to add on big categories that the American Society of Civil Engineers did not address in their 16 categories that they cover, but we think they're indispensable. We want to build this high-speed rail network and the bill, the new version of the bill uh, now includes these 17,000 miles that Dr. Metcalf said would be an economical high-speed rail network all across the country. Wouldn't you like not to have to sit in traffic going around your ring road around your city or taking two hours, maybe even one way a day to get to work every day and going to the gas pump and filling up your car to pay for sitting in traffic on a toll road and not going anywhere. This actually uh, is costing our economy a whole lot uh, in wasted fuel uh, and wasted time and, uh, and stopping uh, trucks moving more slowly. So if we can fix congestion, if we could get more people onto a high-speed rail, if we could get more freight onto a high-speed rail network, that would be a great investment in our economy. Similarly, we're having a food crisis in the United States. Most people don't know about it. It's not high on the radar right now, uh, but um, Don um, Cephas is going to talk to you about uh, a way that we can work on using our National Infrastructure Bank to, to prevent and forestall a food crisis where we stop growing food in the United States. And then you're going to see what happens to food prices in the supermarket. It's going to be very critical. So we need some large scale water projects all across the country to solve this food crisis, a pending food crisis problem. Another big area that the bank needs really to cover is building more affordable housing for the very lowest income earners who are having a really, really rough time right now. They don't have the money to pay for their rent, to buy food, to buy medicine, uh, and they're struggling, and many of them are going to be evicted from their homes. If we can build more affordable housing, hire them into these great paying jobs, pay them great paying wages to build affordable housing, get our housing stock back on track. European countries have done this. We used to do it, uh, for example, in World War II, when we had mobilized to build new, uh, open new uh, manufacturing centers. We built the affordable housing, we built the schools, we built the, the hospitals and everything that was needed for, for our workers to do their jobs. And that's what we need to do with the National Infrastructure Bank today. So just to let you know, all together, our new bill hopefully will come out at $7 trillion to cover everything, and it'll be much, much more than has been provided in new money from the recently passed bipartisan infrastructure law. And then finally, we could be head heading into a recession in 2023. Just wanted to remind you about that. This is the picture of the leading economic indicators. And you can see that they're crashing right now. They've gone below the zero mark. Whenever it falls below zero, that's an indicator that we're going to have an imminent recession. Those indicators include things like a housing construction, which is way down because of high mortgage uh, prices, manufacturing, which has been off since 2021. Uh, a lot of things are crashing right now, and uh, it looks like the Federal Reserve will continue that's what they announced in mid-December. They will continue their policies to, to clamp down on the money supply, cause a recession, put millions of people out of work. This is really going to damage small businesses. It's going to damage uh, taxes coming into your local um, legislatures to, to, to fix your uh, local roads and things like that. Will, so we're going to need the bank 
even more to offset this coming recession. We can hire these unemployed workers and train them up for 21st century jobs, build small businesses in your communities, uh, get your get all the potholes fixed in your area, build new schools, do all the things that we need to get our economy back on track again. So I'll stop right there uh, and you can ask questions uh, in the, during the question period. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Alfeca. Very in-depth, a lot of information there. Uh, I'm sure there's a couple of questions I saw that uh, are in the chat. I will make sure that uh, we go back to them. Uh, moving forward here, I want to move it along so we can get our presenters to, to do their uh, things. We're looking at Don Sifkis. I'm sure I butchered your name, I apologize. Um, he's an MIT trained chemical engineer uh, who used to work for General Motors Design and is now retired out in California. So the floor is yours, Don. All right, I want to talk to you about this disaster that's looming on the Colorado River. Just so everyone understands what we're talking about, this is the Colorado River Basin. I want to draw your attention to four points on here. Here's the Glen Canyon Dam that backs up Lake Powell, Hoover Dam that backs up Lake Mead, Parker Dam that forms Lake Havasu, and the two branches off of Lake Havasu, the Colorado River Aqueduct and the Central Arizona Project. I'll talk about more of those in a minute. We all know the huge problem Lake Mead and Lake Powell face. These are the two largest freshwater reservoirs in the United States. The level has been dropping steadily over the last 25 or 30 years. This is Lake Mead. Those funny towers there are the water intake towers for the hydroelectric turbines that produce the electricity. 36 years or 30, 17 plus 21, 38 years that water's been dropping. So this is a horrendous problem because neither Lake Mead nor Lake Powell can produce electricity to 100% right now because of the low waterhead. This is the back of Glen Canyon Dam, the same situation. On the left is a schematic of the Colorado River aqueduct, which runs from Parker Dam and Lake Havasu on the Arizona-Colorado border over to Los Angeles and down to San Diego. Central Arizona Project takes water out of the same lake, Lake Havasu, and sends it wet east to Phoenix down to Tucson. Phoenix, Tucson, Los Angeles, San Diego could not exist without the existence of those two water systems that depend on the Colorado River. What is the actual shortfall in Lake Mead and Lake Powell? Well, to fill them to 100% of capacity, we would need 11 trillion gallons of water. That's a lot of water. Don't think we have to fill them full, but if we got to 50% capacity, we could do it with 5.5 trillion gallons of water. And then the downstream infrastructure of the Colorado River that already exists could be used to provide water to the 40 million people there that depend on this and the farmers that produce at least $25 billion worth of our food supply every year. How much water are we talking about to get up there? Well, let's say if we could pump 100,000 gallons per second, which is the capacity of the California aqueduct. That's the long aqueduct that goes down the center part of California. It would take a year and nine months to get 5.5 trillion gallons up there. That's a reasonable amount because the Bureau of Reclamation has two reservoirs on the north end of the Colorado River Basin that can allow two more emergency releases over the next two years, but that's gonna be it. After that, we're gonna have to have incredibly severe water cutbacks which is gonna be a disaster for these 40 million people and farmers and ranchers. Now, where can you find 100,000 gallons per second of water? That note does not have a political basis to hold on to it. Some people wanna bring water down from the Snake River over the Continental Divide down to the Green River on the west slope of the Rockies. That isn't gonna work because the Snake River's volume is really not large enough to give up 100,000 gallons per second. And it is the main tributary for the Columbia River which has commercial shipping and the entire Bonneville power system. Some people want to take water from the Great Lakes. Well, that's probably illegal because you have to be one of the states that touches the Great Lakes to even consider taking water from it. And the water molecules in the Great Lakes don't separate themselves neatly into American and Canadian water. So if you tried it, you'd have a bunch of irate Canadians across the river in Detroit demonstrating. And we certainly wouldn't want irate Canadians demonstrating against us. Other people want to take water from uh, the main channel, the Mississippi of Davenport, Iowa, and ship it across the frozen tundra 
of Nebraska and Kansas up to Denver, drop some water off, reverse flow in one of the Moffat or Robert tunnels that currently bring water from the west range on the Rockies to Denver and then to the Green River. Don't try to take water from the main channel to Mississippi. That's going to create political havoc. The one place that we know of, there may be other places, but if they are, we don't know about them, is the Atchafalaya River in Louisiana. If a formal name for it is the Atchafalaya Basin Floodway, which was really built back in 1953 when the Army Corps of Engineers built what's called the Old River Control Complex to control flooding on the lower Mississippi into New Orleans and to prevent the Mississippi from changing channels. This is a schematic of the Old River Control Structure Complex on the Mississippi. I've been on the Mississippi. I've seen this myself. I was in a boat on the Atchafalaya River. It's a big river. The Atchafalaya Basin is the largest river swamp system in the United States. It's very important ecologically. We don't want to do anything to damage it, but there's a lot of water that goes down the Atchafalaya River, and we want to take a small amount of that and send it to the Glen Canyon Dam, Lake Powell, to make certain that we can keep those two dams producing electricity and provide water downstream to residents and farmers. How much water is actually on the Atchafalaya River? This chart's a little hard to read if you've never seen it before. It's the actual hydrograph from the Army Corps of Engineers. It represents the discharge rate at Simsport, Louisiana, which is just south of that confluence of the Red River, the Atchafalaya River, and the outflow channel from the Old River Control Complex. This is not water from the main channel of the Mississippi River. That water of the main channel isn't touched by this. But you can see this purple line is the average since they started the Old River Control Complex. And I used to say it's about 2 million gallons a second. Actually, it's closer to about 4 million gallons per second is the long-term average. I like to use 2 million gallons per second because that's what it's been in recent years because the whole country sort of been in a drought with lesser rainfall. But 2 million gallons per second is a reasonable number. This black line is the actual flow in 2022. You see it's already coming back up. We propose taking this little orange level way down at the bottom. That little orange line at the bottom represents 100,000 gallons per second of water. I don't think the alligators of the fish of the Achalaya would even miss it. So what we would propose is this, building an aqueduct from that little point from the old river control complex all the way up to the Glen Canyon Dam. You might be able to run it up to the San Juan River in New Mexico and ship it over to Lake Powell because of San Juan, but that would be a decision made by people that are really knowledgeable on actually how to do this thing. We've done it before. In World War II, between 42 and 43, we built two large oil pipelines in less than a year that were financed by the Reconstruction Finance Corporation that Bob just mentioned. The National Infrastructure Bank does the same thing as the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. There's no reason they cannot finance this. Two questions, what would it cost and how long would it take? Well, there's a way, two ways to get at the cost of this thing. This is an aerial picture of Interstate 5 and the California Aqueduct. But anyway, Interstate 5 runs north and south through the center of California. This is close to where I live. On the right, that is the California Aqueduct, which carries 100,000 gallons per second of water. This is the Colorado River Aqueduct from Lake Havasu over to Los Angeles. You can see it goes through the Mojave Desert. It goes up and down through siphon channels. A lot of it is open channel, just like the main California aqueduct. We know how to build these things. So there's two ways to get at the cost. We built 46,000 miles of interstate highway in this country at a total cost of $525 billion in 2022 dollars. That's 11, that's $11 million per mile. That includes the bridges. Bridges are the expensive part of building the road. We want to build a 1,400 mile aqueduct, $15 billion. The Colorado River Aqueduct, you can look at it from that standpoint because that was a very difficult thing to build. It won a huge award for being one of the greatest civil engineering feats of all time to build it across the Mojave Desert and over the Sierra Madre Mountains. It's a series of open channels, tunnels, siphons, pipes. The same thing that we'd have to do for this type of thing. 242 miles long, it, it would cost $3.7 billion in 2022 dollars. So it's five points, uh, the, our, our proposal is 5.7 times the length. So it would cost about $21 billion. I think those are reasonable numbers, okay? In comparison, let's talk about the 
a program in New Orleans that the Army Corps of Engineers just finished. They know how to pump water, the Army Corps of Engineers. They know how to do anything. They just installed this now closure system in the city for $615 million that can pump up to 182,000 gallons a second. They tested it, it works. Now, I just found out a day or two ago that in the National Defense Authorization Act, Congress just approved $34 billion out of the federal budget for a coastal barrier to protect Houston in case a hurricane comes. Now, that is not a loan. That is direct expenditure by combining taxpayer money all from people all over the United States. It's the largest Army Corps of Engineers project ever. So we can spend $20 billion in a loan that'll be paid back through very small increments on water and electricity usage uh, to protect 40 million people every year and to protect $25 billion in food supply every year. And that seems to me that's a lot better deal than spending $34 billion out of taxpayer money for a hurricane that might or might not appear. How long would this take to build? That I can't tell you exactly, but I can, but I do know an expert on how to do this. And if you use the following big machines, which I'll show you pictures of, but I won't take time to discuss, he tells me we can do 15 miles a day to actually build a 1400 mile trench, three months. Plus then you'd have to add on time to add the concrete channels and to add the um, tunneling through the continental divide. We'd wanna go over the continental divide at the low point on the south side of it, which would be close to Campbell, New Mexico, just east and south of Albuquerque. One last slide. We have no problem whatsoever in this country from taking oil and gas where it is in Texas and the Gulf Coast and pumping it through 190,000 miles of liquid petroleum pipelines all over this country. There's absolutely no reason why we can't pump water all over this country from places that have it, like the Atchafalaya River Basin, the places that don't have it, like the Colorado River Basin. So in summary, $20 billion to solve this disaster that's looming on the Colorado River, I think is a pretty good deal. And if you haven't done it already, I wanna urge everybody to write, call their Congressman and US Senator and tell them you wanna vote for the new version of HR 339 and to do that as soon as possible. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for that, Don. Uh, it's uh, this is the first time I've seen uh, this explanation, and to me, it makes a lot of sense to be able to do it uh, as a uh, someone who is a plumber, pipe fitter my entire career. Uh, I'm somebody who has a great appreciation for oil, gas, and especially water at the end of the day. And uh, those are things that we need to really be able to to figure out how to be able to um, to apply. Those are the droughts that we are currently experiencing. Uh, we all know it's due to uh, a lot of uh, uh, fossil fuels being burnt, et cetera, but how do we continue to do that? I think that's where the innovation that could come from the infrastructure money being spent on large projects like this, we could really uh, jumpstart that uh, uh, <clears throat> mental uh, capacity that I think is kind of pent up and we'd be able to allow people to be able to really start to expand and, and utilize that. Uh, with that, we're going to move on to our last presenter, before we start doing the questions. And this is Mary Alford. She's a professional engineer and she's from the Alchoa County. She's also an Alchoa County Commissioner. And uh, she is a principal with the Sustainable Design Group in Gainesville, Florida. So the floor is yours, Mary Alford. Uh, good afternoon. First, uh, let me start by stating that um, while I'm an engineer, I've worked for around 20 years in the utility industry in one form or another in environmental compliance as an engineer, project manager in management and on advisory boards. Uh, but I, I don't claim to be an expert. This field is very broad and highly technical. So there are many experts on this call. So if I have oversimplified this presentation in order to make it easier to un understand, I apologize. And I hope I didn't make any mistakes uh, in trying to make it as short as I could. So this is uh, the uh, old school electric grid, the grid that you probably grew up with. Uh, much of it was created after 1936 when Roosevelt established the Rural Electrification Administration and money was lent from a national infrastructure bank to bring electricity to everyone across the country. 
Um, but you know, generally this means that we go to a power plant and let's see if I can, we go to the power plant, the generating station, we make our power, we step up the voltage so that we can send it down transmission lines without losing that electricity. Then we step it down before distribu distribution lines take it to um, small commercial or small factories or, or your house. Uh, some large factories um, use the high voltage uh, electricity that's taken right to them, like for instance, an auto manufacturer. So you might have had the system explained to you like a system of water pipes. You flip the light switch and the water comes on or the electricity comes on just like your water pipes. But it's a lot more complicated on that. When you uh, push the handle down on your toaster, you're using the same energy that is, factory, uh, that is uh, powering that factory down the road. And you're using a lot less of it. And so one of the challenges for a power plant is balancing all of those needs. Because if the amount of energy that was sent to that factory was sent to your toaster, well, you might think the toaster would explode, but what would really happen is your electricity would go off. So your electricity stops running working when there's too much energy in the lines, as long as when there's not enough. That just means it's out of balance. So um, there's this is a real challenge for electrical utilities that um, you know we we've known for many years that when everybody gets home at five o'clock in the um, afternoon. Everyone adjusts their thermostats, they start cooking dinner, they take showers, they do laundry, and the power company anticipates those needs and the generating station or the power plant ramps up production in anticipation of those needs. Now, what a lot of people don't realize is that as much as 30% of the power that that generation station makes is wasted because um, they have to have it there in case you need it, but they don't necessarily know if you're going to need it. And this has been um, further complicated by current changes in the grid, which I'll get down, get to um, later. But my point was here is that it's regulated in many states. And power plants can't just push a button and increase their production. It takes some of our most expensive power plants to run, basically big jet engines that um, run on natural gas or other kinds of fuel. It takes those 15 minutes to come online. And it can take what we call baseload plants, the big coal plants or nuclear plants or other plants that you might see, those are called baseload plants. And for the baseload plants to ramp up, it can take as long as 24 hours. So the, but the grid can't wait that long. It needs the electricity when it needs it. So in states where regulations have been relaxed, it's been problematic. You may remember that in Texas in 2021, during uh, that really unprecedented blizzard, 75% of the state lost power. Some power plants were only making 5% more than they needed because gas prices were high. But more importantly, the weakness of Texas's power grid became apparent as power lines came down, as windmills froze, gas lines froze, and solar power wasn't available. Their grid had also not been weatherized. They had high customer demand due to the record low temperatures and production couldn't keep up with demand and the grid couldn't be balanced. Today, this means more than just not being able to turn on a light or make a piece of toast. Everything from security systems to cell phones rely on electric power and even hospitals with generators are not set up to operate for very long. Events like this are truly devastating and those of us that live in Florida are very, very aware of that. Um, after hurricanes. And as we see more climate disruption, we will see more events like this one, and we need to be prepared, which leads me to the next slide. This is uh, the power plant more like it is uh, today. Um, you know, we've added a lot of technology on either side of the transmission distribution system. We have uh, solar farms, wind farms, um, and on the other side, we have electric vehicles. We have a lot of distributed distribution of solar farms on our solar panels on roofs. And uh, it, all of these things are a little more complicated to balance, but the generation, the transmission distribution in the middle there, it's still the same technology and the same, um, or a lot of the same technology as it originally was. We haven't really created a new system. 
So when grid stability used to be fairly predictable, we all knew when everybody was coming home at five o'clock and we could have the electricity running for those air conditioners. Now the people responsible for telling the power plants what to do are finding that the sun and the wind are really hard to boss around. And that's all complicated further by the residential and small scale commercial systems at the other end of the substations. When I started working at the utility industry over 20 years ago, um, reliability numbers were really good and very predictable. But today, we are seeing more and more outages that are lasting longer because these outages are harder to predict and the loads are harder to, um, to figure out what they're going to be in the next you know, short distance of time. So um, we can see that the, uh, those numbers are going up steadily and uh, we need reliable power. Transportation as we move to electric rail needs reliable power, water and wastewater plants, lift stations need power, cell phone towers and security need security systems all need reliable power. In addition to these threats of smaller outages, um, they, we have the added threat of cybersecurity and the risk that our entire grid could be attacked as an act of war or terrorism. So being able to quickly isolate those threats and outages and be able to automatically route and balance power in the event of emergency is um, critical for us. So this is the electric grid that, that we need to be working towards. Um, do we need to rethink the entire system? We probably do, but that's a long-term project, and this is what we can, and, and some power companies are doing now. Uh, we need communication across the entire grid system, and here, let me make this a little bit bigger. Um, note that the solid lines there are the um, electric power infrastructure, and the dotted lines are communication systems. Um, my power went out last week, and when I went to um, immediately call the power company and let them know, they, they before I could even do that, they told me my power was out uh, because they know these things instantaneously now if they have the infrastructure in place. So we need that communication. We need energy storage systems across the, across the system uh, that are associated with solar installations, um, which can... And we need uh, smart meters on our homes like I have now, which tell the electric company when your power is out and tell you when things like your appliances aren't working as they should because your power usage pattern changes. Um, we need smart meters on industrial users that detect changes in demand. And we need smart meters on big box stores that allow utilities to uh, stagger when air conditioners come on, for instance, uh, over a period of a few minutes rather than all of them coming on instantaneously. And we need sensors on our transmission and distribution lines, sending that information back to the distribution center so that they can make smart decisions about power production. And we need energy storage everywhere basically to maintain balance. So the cost of upgrading our distribution system is um, just to support electric vehicle and photovoltaic goals that um, our government has set in place is $1 trillion. That's one with a T after it. Um, it could be cheaper if some of these uh, grid upgrades were optimized. And that means if a utility has the money to make all of those changes at one time rather than piecemeal, it's significantly cheaper. So we could save as much as 70% of the cost by optimizing the grid upgrades. The way things are going right now, um, it may cost, it will likely cost the US uh, system more than $7 trillion and take as long as 20 years. Um, part of that is um, the investor owned utilities have been making these changes pretty steadily. They have the capital, they have the borrowing power, and they can go out and install the smart meters like I have on my home. But the smaller publicly owned utilities, such as the electric co-ops or the small uh, publicly owned utility in the town that I uh, just recently moved from, 
um, these, these utilities don't have that borrowing power and they are struggling to keep up with these changing um, demands and changing need, needed changes to their system. Uh, the cost of running the utility has gone significantly up while revenue tends to go down with solar panels and increased, um, uh, increased uh, conservation and energy efficiency on our appliances. So this is this is putting a real financial pressure on the utilities. Um, so for our future and our security, our utilities need access to a national infrastructure bank to become the sustainable utilities the citizens want and that our future requires. Uh, this is one of the reasons that I support the NIB and have support for HR three 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 nine. If I uh, can answer any questions. If there's any time left, I'll be happy to do so as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, as you can see uh, from uh, the presentations today, there is a definite need, and I do believe we all know there's a definite need for investment in our infrastructure system. And so it really comes down to how do we make this happen? The National Infrastructure Bank, I believe, is a perfect vehicle to be able to get the money into the communities and get it, the investment necessary into uh, all these uh, uh, fine ideas and at a pretty massive uh, investment uh, all the way across the board. It's something that we need to do to be able to take on that new, um, that new struggle to be able to, to make sure that we advance this American dream that we've all been living in. Uh, what I'm gonna do right now is I'm going to open the floor for questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand, I'll call on you. Uh, with that being said, I had one question in the chat that I, I guess I want to ask uh, Don. Uh, somebody asked, is, do the calculations that you were making uh, take into account for the evapotranspiration system that could happen? Uh, well, yes, right now, the uh, a lot, uh, practically all of the California aqueduct, the long one that comes down the state is open channel. And uh, much of the Colorado River aqueduct is open channel. So those costs that I mentioned, yes, they just include the evaporation from those. And I don't think it'd be any different going across Texas or New Mexico. Uh, I am not the world's expert on evaporation rates, though. But the water is pretty deep. It's 30 feet deep on the average in that open channel. So it's uh, that's the best I can do. The, the, the cost okay. of running the thing is what it is now with the current evaporation rates. All right. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, our first question is from Bart Reed. Bart, uh, the floor is yours. Please, please ask your question, Bart. Okay. Um, we have this presentation on uh, high-speed rail. Um, in California, <laughs> we brought a uh, motion to bring some seed money in a number of years ago, and we have uh, money funding our building our high-speed rail. But what the gentleman did not explain is if you, since the National Infrastructure Bank pays back low cost loans as a bank from entities that have the source of funding to pay the loans back, where are these entities that would be building these high speed rail systems? Uh, you know, since California has that entity, uh, Nevada to California. You know, we've been trying for what nine years now to get a loan to start construction. So, where are these entities that uh, would be there to get the loans and have some sort of cash flow to pay the, the, the loans back? I think that's my question in simplicity. Okay, Alfeca, uh, <clears throat> you've probably had the most expertise in this. So in the absence of Dr. Metcalf, and we'll forward this question on to him too, to, to ask this question. He has a lot of experience with, with uh, the actual institutions themselves in uh, Britain and in Europe. Um, and we can take a lot of the cues from them. Right here in the United States, at this moment, we have sort of three institutional players. One is Amtrak itself, and that would really... Uh, uh, require a, a reorientation of Amtrak to take on a whole high-speed rail system. 
Uh, another institution is, as you say, the California High Speed Rail uh, Authority, which is its own state-owned authority. Uh, and it, it, it obviously needs uh, much more work in getting its costs down to build high-speed rail and in getting more access to financial resources to actually build its system. And, uh, and then third, there's the, whole, um, I, there's the whole institution of the tracks themselves in the United States. We have 150,000 miles of track in the United States more than any other country in the world. And we're all assuming that new passenger rail systems, new high-speed rail systems would be built on those track rights of way, but they are owned by freight companies and we have a very low utilization of our track system, uh, which really needs a lot of work. So there's institutional changes that are gonna need, be needed all along the, the way, along the line. And then we have the, the, the private sector players that want to get involved in all of this, as Dr. Metcalf suggests with these P3 schemes that could uh, really uh, build, uh, they, they work very successfully. The, the projects he worked on, for example, in Britain, they, uh, the public entities, the public authority actually went into the real estate business, uh, bought up um, centers for rail stations, built uh, high speed uh, density uh, applications for them, and then either sold them back uh, to a private entity or, you know, kept them to, to do, um, um, to collect profits off of the same way we do for airports. There's all uh, scope for doing these things. Um, the basic bottom line is we need a mobilizer for this and the National Infrastructure Bank can act as a mobilizer, build these high speed rail systems. And we also need a, me a method of financing where th this is seen as a government national project. And that's what we need. Thank you very much for that, Alfeca. Next, I'm going to call on Randy Grine. Randy, you have a question? Please unmute. Uh, yeah. Um, actually, this is uh, to Dawn, um, and it's something that uh, that's puzzled me a little bit. Um, the uh, the aqueduct that you're talking about building uh, is uh, the entrance is very very close to sea level, and the terminus is. Mm, well, not not all the way 30, up. 3,700 uh, 3, feet. There, ah, okay, it's higher than I thought. Even uh, that's going to that's going to incur an energy cost to lift that water up. Um, do we know what that's going to take every year, and how, is there any way to offset that? Well, yes, I don't know the number off the top of my head. There's another article out there. That uh, gets into that. I can look that up and send it to you. Okay, I, it'll, I, it'll be partially offset by the electricity that's generated by the extra water that comes down from the dams. And secondly, yeah, those those big machines I showed. Uh, in the interest of time, I didn't spend any time on those. Those big machines are already powered by solar panels. They work that. <laughs> no, they are. No, but no, they, that's great. Those things are. They, they have these panels of solar panels which advance ahead of the machine to store batteries and they put the batteries on the machines and I can send you some information on that. So that, that's uh, it's still, it's gonna take some energy to build it and to actually move the water. The Army Corps of Engineers, as I said, knows how to move 188,000 gallons per second of water <laughs> in New Orleans. And I, I just don't think that's a problem. A lot of that power will be, will be capable of being solar and wind power in Texas and New Mexico, but there will be some power obviously to move it because you can't increase something, but the payback from moving the water from preventing an absolute disaster is gonna more than pay for any increased cost of uh, moving that water. Oh, I, I agree, I agree. It's, um, it, it's, it, it's, going to, it's, it's going to have a huge payback. Um, I, I'm just glad to see that people have been thinking about the whole picture, not just part of it. Uh, that yes, that's that's true. Now, if you want, uh, do we have your email? I'll, I'll get you that information on the actual power to actually move that much water. But the California aqueduct, the big one, I don't know the power. I don't know how much water the Colorado River aqueduct from Lake Havasu to Los Angeles. I don't know that capacity off the top of my head, but 
I live close to the California aqueduct, the big one, and every day they pump 100,000 gallons per second down that thing. It hits the Tehachapi Mountains just north of Los Angeles. They pump that water up every day 2,000 feet, and they don't seem to have a problem with it. So you'd probably have to have another intermediate reservoir to go up stepwise up to the Glen Canyon Dam, mm -hmm. but it's certainly not insurmountable because we built that operation to go over the Tehachapi Mountains 1973, 27 plus 23 is, my God, 50 years ago. <laughs> I'm sure we can do better today. I just be. hope that they that that we do something about uh, reworking water rights in the West because that's a that's a continuing problem they're having. Oh. Yeah, and Don, don't forget to mention that uh, the uh, Colorado River Aqueduct to Los Angeles gets its power from the hydro from the hydroelectricity produced on the Colorado River. So without that new electricity, there won't be any water arriving in Los Angeles. Wow. And so, if you don't, if you can, cannot allow Hoover Dam and Glen Canyon Dam to go down, if you do, you're talking water rationing in Phoenix, Tucson, Los Angeles, San Diego, and that just should not be allowed to happen. Agreed. Okay, uh, moving on to the next question. I have one from Dale. Lahar. My question is, is that when you're running this uh, aqueduct from Louisiana all the way up into Texas and New Mexico, uh, in the previous sessions, we've had people from the state of New Mexico and they have a tremendous uh, water so shortage. Aren't they going to be a little concerned that all this water is going to go up straight to um, into the uh, <clears throat> uh, Lake Powell, or I think it was Lake Powell, um, and and they're going to be left out with with their own state situation. What about Texas? Their political consequences. So I was wondering what your thoughts are on that. Well, <clears throat> my thoughts are that that's not a problem because right now the California Aqueduct and the Colorado River Aqueduct gets split into different branches that feed different parts in the final analysis. Part of it goes down to San Diego. Part of it goes to Long Beach. They split it up. So is this thing is properly designed? Look, I'm not a pipeline or aqueduct designer, but it's obvious that you have a pipeline aqueduct system built that you could run, uh, what do you call it, branches off of it. So you could run a branch off the uh, thing as it crosses New Mexico and send it up to the San Juan River or someplace else. And in Texas, certain dry areas, they could also have little branches running off this thing. So uh, that's the way it would actually be done in actual practice. That would all have to be worked out. And there has to be an authority set up to actually run this thing. It would probably be run by the same organization that built the Hoover Dam. Probably the Bureau of Reclamation somehow would set up a task force to actually do this and decide uh, uh, <clears throat> how they wanted to distribute that water. With the main target being Lake Powell and then using the existing infrastructure to distribute the water but you could have branches running off, and I would imagine that would be what would actually happen. Okay. okay. And if, and if I you. could add on to that, don't forget this is one water management project that the National Infrastructure Bank is suggesting. We have a whole host of other projects that could come on board to add, to aid both New Mexico and Texas. Texas is a classic example. They are either feast or famine with their water supply. They already have a lot of groundwater usage and depletion in areas like San Antonio, uh, the upper panhandle on the Ogallala Aquifer. Uh, they have flooding in Houston for for which they've built now this, they're going to build this, this Ike Dyke that uh, uh, Don has mentioned for $34 billion uh, to protect, protect against hurricanes. And uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on groundwater in both the states of New Mexico and pumping from different sections in the state, either from primary water resources. Texas has got a huge water aquifer along its border with uh, Mexico, and that can be utilized all across the state. So there's lots of other things that we can do in addition adding on agricultural conservation to 
have states like Arizona produce agricultural goods more sustainably. Uh, and um, farmers, of course, are using 40% of the resources, of the water resources in these states, and they can reconform the way that they grow agriculture. All these kinds of projects, the National Infrastructure Bank can help to finance and do selective comparison, um, sort of triage among the projects to make sure that we're picking out the very best ones for their area. The other reason I like the National Infrastructure Bank is Cities and ent political entities can go and ask for a loan directly. What's happened? What's happening in Jackson, Mississippi? What happened in St. Joseph, Michigan? What happened in Flint, Michigan? Should never be allowed to happen again. A city like Jackson, Mississippi, could just go to the bank, ask for a long term loan, get the thing fixed now, and pay it back over a. It took us 50 years to pay off Hoover Dam, and pay it back over a very long period of time by adding very small increments of fees to the water bills. We have made a mistake in this country by trying to get people to always look for federal grants that don't have to be paid back. We need to start educating people more and it's okay to borrow the money long-term at very low cost. So I just wanna get that point in there that, that we should not tolerate what's happening in Jackson, Mississippi and Flint, Michigan. Absolutely. And uh, to, to build on that, I mean, we all take mortgages out to buy our homes, etc. What we're talking about here is taking a mortgage out on the future of America to be able to, to build what we need to be able to, to, to build that infrastructure so that we can continue to build and advance uh, all that needs to get done. The debt in this country that we currently have will never get repaid by just cutting things. The only way it's going to be ever paid off is by growing things and being able to do that. And that takes an investment to be able to continue to grow our economy, to be able to make those kind of payments off at the end of the day. And that's what this infrastructure bank is. This is the, this is the money that's necessary to, to build this infrastructure so that we can continue to build and expand our economy and be able to then hopefully be able to pay our debts off and be able to continue to do it. But it's about growing. It's not about trying to cut and be able to do that. So all those things are important. Uh, it appears I'm to in. Have... I'm in. Bob, I'll vote for you. Okay. <laughs> Bart, Bart Reed, you have one more question. Bart, the floor is yours one more time. We're talking about water. Now, we have a number of environmental um, entities, everything from Sierra Club to Natural Resources Defense Fund and all. Has any of this these ideas been vetted through these agencies? They don't know uh, Part of the problem with housing in California is that we have certain neighborhood groups and neighborhood individuals that, you know, their 10 acre plot of land being converted to housing is just bad. So we don't have enough room to house people. So we house them on the sidewalks. So, you know, we could use the water, but uh, our environmental organizations need to be lined up with some. Uh, a positive uh, output so we can actually move these kinds of ideas through. So well, it's who can, it's, who can it's speak gonna on? Us, yeah, can it's going to take a, a real conversation to where we have to start to get back to being we, the United States, instead of me. And those are things that we're going to have to do on a local community uh, region. And we're going to have to start reaching out and actually talking to people, talking to all these different uh, groups that are out there instead of allowing them to continue to operate in silos by themselves. Uh, if we're ever gonna get this uh, country moving uh, and, and continue to move forward to be able to do that, we have to be able to willing to discuss, listen, et cetera, in order to be able to do that. And it's gonna take some listening on all of our parts. My, my grandfather always used to tell me, he said, Bobby, you got two ears and one mouth and that's the proportion they should be used in. And I encourage everyone on this call, when you start to discuss whatever it is, politics, anything, listen twice as much as you talk and we all might learn something and then we'll be able to make some real advances in this thing at the end of the day. I saw Ellen Brown. Ellen, it, uh, you seem like you wanted to say something. Ellen, floor is yours. Yeah, sorry. I, when Don was saying about the what went wrong in Flint, Michigan, et cetera, I, I'm sorry, but I'm, I wasn't sure what he meant. What, what, are, what were they doing wrong that you're doing differently? Well, there's nothing wrong in Flint, Michigan, but I mean, they argue, argue, argue over who's going to pay to fix it. Flint could, City could just go to this bank, get the money, rip out all those lead lines, replace them, and be done with it. Okay, it's too late to do it now, but I don't want that to ever happen, happen again. That's what I'm, uh, 
was just saying okay, if we would have had this bank in place the problem could have been solved but we didn't so you try to go get the money someplace and nobody wants to pay it it's like bob said nobody wants to help poor flint michigan okay so this bank can do it and that's why it's really important that we get this thing done okay thank you okay and so if i if i can kind of wrap some things up here uh, we've been on for almost an hour and a half, and so we're coming to the end of this. But I will say this, if if this is something that interests you, there, there's, there were a couple questions about how the bank works to be able to do deposits. Please visit our website. If you visit our website, we have some presentations that were made specifically on how the bank works and operates so that you can get those answers um, and, and, and be able to read them on your own or be able to watch the videos that have been done. So I'd encourage you to do that. And finally, the, the last thing I wanna say is that we are all responsible to be able to go out and reach and talk to our congressmen, our senators, et cetera. Because at the end of the day, what it's gonna take is we have to build this parade so that they can run to the front and take credit for it at the end of the day. But if we don't do that little work, if we don't build the parade to be able to do it, they will never just jump on there and leave. We're, we're not necessarily uh, leaders out there to be able to take this project on. You are the leaders. You are the ones that are going to make this happen at the end of the day. And I encourage all of you at the end of the day to be able to go out there and to be able to talk to those people that need to hear about it. And finally, one of the things that I see that's up on the screen here is Donna and Alfeca have been on a couple of, uh, <clears throat> have done a couple of things and they, they've gotten uh, some of their, um, editorials covered, etc. There is a, a, a wealth of information out there to be able to do that. I encourage you to read that, to be able to continue uh, to be able to talk about this. But these are things that need to be talked about every day. And we all have that opportunity. And I strongly encourage all of you to do that. Uh, with that, I encourage everybody to have a fantastic day and continue to work on it. And stay tuned as we get the new number for this bill and so that we can move it forward. With that, everyone have a good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are in the, in the world at the moment, and have a fantastic day. There's all the information you need right there, the uh, website, our Facebook, Twitter, and our email. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day.